Hi, and welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, we, to this month's Lunchtime Learning Series, we're really pleased to have with us local author Jim Parr here to share with us today from his upcoming book, World War II Massachusetts. I'm Tara Hall and I'm a media and program specialist here at the Framingham Public Library. And a few notes just before we begin. If you haven't already, if you wouldn't mind silencing your cell phones, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, following the program, we have evaluation forms in the back of the room on that small table. We'd love to get your feedback. And as someone who works in marketing, I am especially interested in how you found out about this program. So if you wouldn't mind sharing with us, we'd really appreciate it. I'm going to share with you one other upcoming program we have as well. We've got our Technology Learning Center and Homework Center ribbon cutting coming up this Monday night in the evening at 5.30. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, our new center is upstairs. And we've got Mayor Charles Sitsitsky coming and joining us, and we hope you will as well. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Jim Parr. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know almost everyone in the room. That's great. <laughs> um, so I'm Jim Parr. I taught in Framingham for 27 years. I taught elementary school for a total of 34. And uh, I've been retired a year ago, June. So now I'm uh, continuing to uh, research local history and, and write some books about it. Um, I've written, this is my fourth book. Uh, two of them I wrote with my friend and co-writer, Kevin Swope. And they're all with the History Press. And so what I want to say about these books is that, and especially the World War II Massachusetts book, it is not a history of World War II in Massachusetts. And I'll tell you why. <clears throat> this is a history of Lowell in, Mass in World War II. This is a history of Cambridge in World War II. This is the history of Haverhill in World War II. So a comprehensive history of Massachusetts in World War II is just not possible. So I focus on the story part um, in all of these books. I try to find the interesting story, the story that might be a footnote in a story that might not have been told for 80 years or that hasn't been grouped together with similar stories. And um, I found some really amazing stories that make the Massachusetts story unique but yet connected to really the rest of the country um, in their World War II experience. So the, um, the book is set up, and being a teacher and writer, I, I have a lot of shun endings, so all of my chapters um, end in shun. So the first section is preparation. So the World War II story in America really starts before December 7th, 1941. So in the back of the book, I actually have a timeline, and I've highlighted some of the events uh, before the bombing of Pearl Harbor that are important. And the reason being that people could, even though there was a, there was a lot of <clears throat> you know, discussion about should we go into the war and should we not, um, there were many people who were isolationists who did not want to enter the war or help Britain. Um, one of them was our own Senator David Walsh. And there were people who um, felt like we should ha help them, but most people knew it was inevitable. And some of these events kind of prove that. Um, in 1940, Westover Field, out in the western part of the state, they had actually started planning that in 1939. It was not coincidental. Um, <clears throat> and then we have some other uh, world events. I don't know if you can see my... Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Uh, I can't really see it. Oh, wait, there it is. Okay. So, um, you know, 1940, Hitler invades uh, Belgium and the Netherlands. And then we have the re a response from FDR, who is kind of dancing around the whole helping Britain thing without actually um, going into war. And then September 16th, we'll talk about this a little more, there's the first peacetime draft since the Civil War. Um, camp Edwards, which had been sort of a National Guard camp, was expanded and greatly to become uh, the largest camp in Massachusetts. That was in 1940. Um, FDR is elected. Um, the Office of Civilian Defense was established in 1941. We returned to the uh, bond program. It had been around during the um, World War I. And um, then some other things. Uh, the summer of 41, people were affected by different things. So even if they were isolationists and weren't interested in the war, it was affecting them directly. 
Um, in September, the battleship USS Massachusetts was launched at the Quincy shipyard. And then December 7th, Pearl Harbor was attacked. So as I said, the, um, the peacetime draft, the first one since the Civil War, it took place in September. Um, and it was all men ages 21 to 45 had to register for the draft. And the uh, Secretary of War, which was uh, Henry Stimson, he pulled the, he closed his eyes, he reached in, he pulled the capsule with this man's lucky number, which was 138. Interestingly enough, this guy's father was the first man pulled for World War I. So he was kind of a local celebrity. <clears throat> and they had to start reporting in January to, a lot of them went to Fort Devens and, and some of the other camps. And it was, it was a one-year service. And then after we entered the war, the, that extended to 18 months. And then, then there was just no going back. The bond program started. <clears throat> this was in April of 1941. In World War I, they were called Liberty Bonds. And the bond program had several purposes. Um, the citizens were under the impression, and for the most part, that they were, um, so they were investing in the war. They would buy a bond, and then they could um, get interest on it at a later date. But it was also a propaganda program. And, and the person who was um, put in charge of it was actually a professor at Amherst College. His name was Peter Odegaard, and he was an, a uh, professor of political science, and he was an expert on propaganda. So, and, and propaganda is not necessarily a negative thing, but it was to, to get people behind um, the war effort and to make them feel a part of it. And for this effort, he chose this symbol that everyone in Massachusetts should be familiar with. This is the Minuteman statue, which is at the foot of the bridge in Concord. Um, it was sculpted by Daniel Chester French, in 1871, he also did the uh, bust of General Gordon, which is in a part of our Framingham History Center collection. So this Minuteman statue was everywhere. It was on the bonds themselves. It was on the stamps. That's a poster. Um, and you would see this in, in stores, in banks. And it was the symbol throughout the entire war for the uh, bond program. Notice that on the, this is a, um, a stamp album. The kids could collect stamps, like 10 cents at a time. And it, originally they were called defense bonds, and then after December 7th, they just stamped the word war on them because we were at war. So. so that summer of 1941, there are a couple of things that happened. Uh, the first one was that silk production was curtailed because the, um, whatever silk we had, we wanted to make sure that it was available for war use, and we also had no silk imports. And so a couple of pictures here. Uh, the bottom one on the left, those are some women in Boston who are going bare-legged to show their support and their patriotism. Um, the top and, um, is actually an ad for stockings. And I think most of us know, but it's hard to, to think about, but th that stockings were a huge part of a woman's wardrobe. Women didn't wear pants back in the 40s for the most part. And they wore dresses and they wore silk stockings. And nylon had just been introduced um, a few years before, and it wasn't that popular. So this ad was from Gilchrist's, um, and the V stood for victory and not for vanity, and they called them their um, victory stockings, and they were, I think they were 79 cents a pair. On the right, we see some people uh, um, from Maine who got stuck because they didn't realize that um, starting in, on August 3rd, oh, that's funny. <laughs> Sorry, my, my phone, where I have my notes, it started uh, writing, it, it was voice to text, so everything I just said is now <laughs> in part of my notes. <laughs> no wonder I'm getting confused. Oh, wow. Anyway, uh, so starting August 3rd, <clears throat> gas sales were curtailed, mostly in the East Coast because a lot of the tankers were getting sunk by German U-boats. So they could only sell gas from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. There were no nighttime sales. And a lot of people who didn't realize this kind of got stuck on the side of the road. So that was, this was all before Pearl Harbor. And there was, there was more to come. OK. So reaction. So we have the attack on Pearl Harbor. And people reacted in different ways. Governments reacted. Businesses reacted. And we're going to take a look at some of those. 
So these are some of the headlines from Massachusetts. It's doing it again. Sorry. Technology. All right. These are some of the headlines from Massachusetts newspapers. Um, interesting, I looked it up. So, whoops. Over here, we, the House voted 388 to 1. Does anyone know who that one nay was to go to war? I had to look it up. It was um, Jeanette Rankin, who was from Montana. And she had, she had also voted no when the United States uh, went into World War I, too. And she was a, a, um, a suffragette. She was for uh, women's rights. And she was a, a, a very, very, she stuck to her guns about peace. And she said, nope, this, just, there should never be any war. So she was the one nay vote. And then soon after that, <clears throat> things really ramped up. Um, one of the biggest fears was that another air attack would happen. And so there were many, many things that were done to prevent <clears throat> an air attack, especially being on the coast um, and having some, some pretty important you know, um, military installations and manufacturing. So in March of 1942, they painted <clears throat> the dome of the State House gray. They, they had to scrape off the, um, the gold leaf, and they had to paint it gray um, because they thought that that might end up being a target. Hold on. I, I'm going to fix my notes here. <laughs> Um, and they also wanted to reduce any light source that enemy planes could see. But not just enemy planes, but also submarines. There was something called Sky Glow. And Sky Glow is the artificial light that um, goes vertically upward from cities and towns. And what Sky Glow, when it existed, what it did was it would silhouette ships at sea so that tankers would have a much easier target. And so there was a... a a big push, especially in coastal towns, to eliminate sky glow. They also had blackouts and dimouts, and there's a difference between the two. So a blackout was for a shorter period of time, and that's when you tried to extinguish all light possible. And you can see this one here. I think this was from Haverhill. It was for 20 minutes, because it's really a long period of time to have absolutely no light. It's kind of dangerous. So um, you can read here that all lights, um, had to be ex extinguished. They had to have blackout curtains so that the light wouldn't escape from their houses. Um, there were no signs outside that were on. Um, this is where the civil defense people would come in and make sure they would check because you could be fined or even arrested if you weren't following the blackout rules. <clears throat> a dim out is different. A dim out was in place for several years. And the dim out, as you can see, um, Framingham wasn't as affected by this as some of the other towns that were within three miles of the coastline or 12 miles of Boston. So during a dim out, and at first it was voluntary, and then when people weren't really doing it, then it became mandatory. Um, so all advertising and display signs, that included uh, Christmas lights, outside Christmas lights. Um, street lights had to be covered, and they had a lower wattage bulb, and there weren't as many street lights. It would be maybe every other street light was on. Um, people had to buy <clears throat> shields for their headlights. And somebody told me the name, like a nickname for them, and I don't remember what it was. It's not in the book, sorry. Um, and so, again, th some of these, these are coastal towns. You can see Gloucester, Beverly, Salem, et cetera. And then within three miles, <clears throat> there were, um, and I'll show you a, a good picture of it. So these were some of the other regulations for people who lived like right near the coast. Um, if you were parking, you had to park facing away from the coast so that your headlights wouldn't illuminate. And Framingham is like right just outside the map here. So we weren't part of the greater Boston anti-glare area. So that's what a dim out was. And, and people had to live under these conditions for about three years. Something else that happened within the first few days of, of the attack on Pearl Harbor was that um, President Roosevelt, all right, this is really vexing me <laughs> at this moment. Um, let's see. 
You, no, it, it worked great the last time. We, all right, let me do this. Sorry. All right. No, this was, this was like so good before. It really was. All right, and now I think I got it under control. All right, so on December 11th, um, Germany and Italy declared war in the United States. And President Roosevelt classified all Germans, Italians, and Japanese living in the country as enemy aliens. So there were about 200,000 of them um, <clears throat> living in Massachusetts. They had to turn in all their firearms, their shortwave radios, and their cameras to the nearest police station um, by January 5th. They would all need to register as enemy aliens um, by the end of February. Their travel was restricted. <clears throat> they were fingerprinted. If they wanted to go outside of their own town, they had to um, ask for permission a week in advance. Um, mostly, it was the Italians who were affected. We did not have large groups of Japanese or um, there were some Germans, but mostly Italians living in Boston, Pittsfield, and other locations. This is a picture of the Italian fishing fleet, which was grounded because they were worried that some of the, uh, the boats might bring supplies to enemy submarines, such as, um, you know, diesel fuel or whatever. So it, it just gives you an idea. This is, this is in the, you know, the days right after the war, that people were scared, they were confused, and, and they just were trying to, to figure it out. So thousands of people reported to their um, local offices by the February 28th deadline, and the FBI were doing surveillance in neighborhoods, um, and they had several raids to make sure that they could, you know, ferret these people out and, and do whatever. Um, all of the things they turned in were held at the Springfield Armory for the duration of the war. And then in November of 19, the enemy alien status was dropped for Italians after a lot of lobbying by Italian Americans. But it was... Um, all right, so if you had to manage an unruly crowd who didn't really listen to directions well and got angry and just caused a lot of chaos, who would you get to do that? I'm going to ask the teachers. <laughs> this is a group of teachers right here, <laughs> retired teachers. And, and that's who um, they got to administer the uh, bull tradition. Um, that was in the, the spring of 42. And people had to go register. They had to give all kinds of information about who was living in their house, how many people, and then they got their sugar ration card. So the schools were closed down for about four or five days all across the state, and the teachers registered people. And then um, they did it a few weeks later for the gas rationing. So these are some housewives in, um, on St. Patal Street just waiting to get their, their ration card. This is just a sample of some of the other things that were affected during the war. Some of them seem kind of random. Um, so fireworks were banned, um, like personal fireworks, and that went into effect in 1943, and it's still in effect 80 years later. Um, there are no personal fireworks in Massachusetts allowed. Um, you could only have 20 different flavors of ice cream. Um, <laughs> all electric signs within 12 miles of City Hall were under the ban. And for a short time, sliced bread was banned. And you might say, why? Um, and it was the steel in the slicers. They, they thought that they really needed the steel. And, they, and what happened was there were, there were some companies who had, you know, like, uh, I guess, spare slicers. So they were still selling sliced bread, and other companies were not. Um, Wonder Bread and Bond Bread, they took out ads describing how to slice bread, because it had been around since 1928, and people just hadn't been slicing bread. And um, there were near riots in some of the stores that had the sliced bread, and so it only lasted for about three months. Then, <clears throat> when it was coming back, um, those same companies took out ads, and I'm going to read you um, an ad from Wonder Bread uh, that was in the Boston Globe, and uh, this is Maybe part of it. It says, what a joy to not have to slice bread. What a blessing that children may once again help themselves to good bread. Now more than ever before in these days of food rationing and shortages, wonder comes as a godsend. So you see why that, that expression, you know, the greatest things in sliced bread, people like their sliced bread. <clears throat> so we also had uh, rubber was rationed, gas was rationed, and so 
horses started to make a comeback, work horses. They hadn't been around for about 20 years or so. And, and this is not just in Massachusetts. This is all across the country. I found examples of people who, who brought... O Old Dobbin was a, a name just for, like, the horse. And the Shea is like a, you know, like a cart or a, a carriage. And uh, that comes from a song. So horses made a reappearance on the streets of... of all towns across Massachusetts. Uh, this happens to be Newton Center. That, that um, horse trough is still there. Now it's a planter. But they had to refurbish it so that the horses could get their water. And this happened in a lot of towns across the country. Um, the city of Springfield, they had to go back to an ordinance of 1902 in order to issue a hackney license because they just hadn't done this in, in years. Um, this, this particular fountain was built in 1880, and it had been retired for about 20 years when they refurbished it. The stable business in Boston tripled. Um, they used them for delivering milk, groceries, newspapers. The post office requested to deliver Christmas packages in 1942. The Boston Herald had given all of its delivery trucks to the Red Cross, so their entire fleet for home delivery was horse-drawn wagons. Um, this was a popular song, Hitch Old Dobbin to the Shea Again. Uh, no. <laughs> but uh, I'll, it, it was based on an old tune called um, Put On Your Old Grape On It. And uh, I'll read you some of the lyrics. It was, uh, brother, take a tip from me and you'll see I'm right. Here's what you'll have to do to keep that date tonight. Hitch Old Dobbin to the Shea Again. You won't use the car anymore. So you gave up your tires, so you're doing your part. If she's patriotic, she'll give up her heart. So hitch old Dobbin to the Shea again. You won't use that car anymore. And that appeared on a couple of uh, radio shows at the time. So uh, there, were, there were problems, though. Um, with all these horses now coming out into action, they were running out of oats to feed them all. And also they, they needed rubber shoes because the, the streets now were paved in such a way that their old... Iron shoes were a little slippery, and there wasn't any rubber. And of course, um, you know, there were people who were just probably trying to skirt the laws and things. So um, within a short time, it became more of a novelty um, in most places. However, they did find another use for old Dobbin. <laughs> That's right. Um, poor Dobbin is right. So. Horse meat was now being um, recommended by the government as an alternative to beef. And uh, the Supreme Market in Quincy advertised ground horse meat at 12 and a half cents a pound. Um, the Clinton Beef Company said that they had sold 30,000 pounds of the meat in three days. And it prompted a, a headline in the Herald, which is, um, Hitch Old Dob into the Frying Pan. So here you can, you can get some nice uh, horse meat steaks at 35 cents a pound. What I found interesting in the same ad is this last line, which really wasn't necessary, which is no waiting. <laughs> um, the faculty club at Harvard, they were getting 15 to 20 orders per day for their luncheon special featuring a horse meat steak, onions, and potato salad. Um, and they had to pass new regulations because people were passing off horse meat as beef, so um, they could not, they were not allowed in Boston anyway to make um, hamburger or uh, sausage. They also, if they were going to sell horse meat, the, the lettering on the package had to be at least an inch high, so people knew what they were getting. Um, so there was a ceiling put on horse meat at 20 cents a pound, um, but as the war dragged on, there were shortages, there was black market horse meat, and again, it was sort of a novelty that and it didn't really catch on. All right, so participation. So everybody had a way to participate in the war. Civilians, men, women, mothers, dads, kids, the family pet. And we'll find out about that. No, not dog meat. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so one way was through scrap drives. And th there had been scrap drives for years before the war. Um, but now they had a new meaning, and more than anything, they were, again, they were morale boosters. There were competitions between schools, between towns, between neighborhoods, and you could win a prize. You could get a, a, a war bond if you brought in the most scrap. And so we have a few 
um, examples here. So this is Governor Leverett Saltonstall, and he's wearing a welder's mask, and he is um, obliterating the face of Hitler just before they take down the decorative iron railing around the State House. And you can see the gray dome in the background. And then, not to be outdone, a week later, Mayor of Boston, Maurice Tobin, he took a torch to the decorative fence around Boston City Hall and uh, set his shoes on fire. And that kind of started this, it was almost like a frenzy to just find iron railings anywhere you could, cemeteries. Um, libraries, city halls, people were just ripping them out and they would sell them to scrap dealers who would then sell them to the government. They even um, went so far as to, well, what else do we have that's iron? Well, we have all these relics from the wars that, you know, that we put in front of our American Legion Hall or our VFW or our town hall. Let's get rid of those too. Um, this is actually um, Pittsfield, and if you're from Framingham, you might you know, sort of make a connection. There's an oxen team carrying a cannon. So from Pittsfield, the American Legion, they recreated the trip of Henry Knox, who during the Revolutionary War brought cannon from Fort Ticonderoga to Boston. And they had a team of oxen bring their cannon, I believe it was from the War of 1812, to Boston Common. They auctioned it off for $375 to a scrap dealer. And these were big events, too. Again, like I said, they were, they were morale boosting. They were, you know, hundreds of people would gather, and, and they'd have parades, and they'd have signs and marching bands when they were bringing the scrap um, to either their own city hall or to Boston. So this is the Concord Free Public Library in Concord. And <clears throat> you can see in this old postcard, there is a decorative iron railing around it. And you can see in this picture from couple, last year, there is no longer a decorative iron railing, but there are holes that show you where the, where the railing was. And so Concord kicked off its um, junk rally week in November of 42 by ripping down the iron fence. And so if you go to places, cemeteries, libraries, and you look for these little holes, most likely there was an iron fence there that was probably scrapped during World War II. Um, uh, there was a woman in Marblehead, uh, Charlotte Bragg, and she, she offered the century-old iron fence around her family cemetery plot. She said that, I know if my father and mother and other dear ones who are buried there were alive, they would want me to do just what I'm doing. Well, the Buckminsters, <laughs> they wanted to keep their iron railing. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things that was, again, that were big morale boosters were rallies, bond rallies, uh, there were fundraisers for different um, war charities. And one of the favorite things to do at these rallies was to have effigies of the three, um, in one town they called them the three incendiary bums. And that was Hitler, Hirohito, and Mussolini. Hitler being the most popular to burn or hang. Um, so we have some, <clears throat> um, some nice little girls in their party dresses and they are nailing a, a, driving a nail into Hitler's coffin uh, that's on Boston Common. This particular story on the right is one of my favorite stories, um, and it happened right next door in Natick. So I'm going to uh, tell you about that. So on August 31st, 1942, they had a bond rally on Natick Common. It, it started with a Horribles Parade. Horribles Parades were, uh, they still have them on the North Shore in some towns, but people would dress up and just do comic scenes in parades. Um, so there was a hay wagon with the hanging effigies of Mussolini and Hitler and Hirohito. They had an auction. They had a Lou Gehrig autographed baseball that, was, that got $1,000. And it was auctioned off by uh, Joe Cronin, who uh, was the manager, player manager of the Boston Red Sox, and Judy Canover and Jackie Cooper, who were radio stars. And then at midnight, they buried Adolf Schickelgruber which was sort of a mocking name for Adolf Hitler. They, people were under the, um, the mistaken idea that this was actually his last name. It had been his father's last name, but then his father's mother married a guy named Hitler. So it never was Adolf Hitler's name. But, and and it, it, it doesn't seem like he's as dangerous and fierce if he's Schickelgruber. So there's lots of examples of him being called Schickelgruber. So at midnight... They buried a coffin with uh, Schickelgruber's effigy inside of it to the uh, jazz tune of 
Um, I'll be glad when you're dead, you rascal you. He stayed on the native common in the ground for a few days, and then some patriotic nativeites decided they didn't want him on their common. So they dug him up, and they dumped him at the Waltham dump. And from there, he was um, taken by some movie executives. I, they're not famous, so I looked them up. And they took it to Boston Common, where they auctioned it off, again, to the highest bidder. And um, Mrs. Lena Becker of Chelsea won it uh, by buying a $500 war bond. So she wanted to dump it off the, the tea wharf, just like the, um, the Boston Tea Party. And the Coast Guard wouldn't let her. So she and her, her um, compatriots, they finally dragged the coffin to the Summer Street Bridge. They tossed it off into the Fort Point Channel, and it floated out to sea, never to be seen again. And, and there, there, there were loads of stories, again, across the country of um, effigies, mostly of Hitler, just hanging. Um, some of them were in honor of, like, employees who were, you know, off fighting war. And um, a lot of them were featured at these rallies. <clears throat> so I mentioned before that um, a lot of the manufacturing concerns, many of them converted to wartime production. And there's just too many to mention, but this one in particular I found interesting. So this is um, the Ford plant at Assembly Square in Somerville. And um, I don't know, it was a mall. I don't know what it is now, but some of you might be familiar with it. So they built these, um, they were troop carriers. They're called Bren gun carriers. And that's an ad on the left from the Globe. Um, and then the Army and Navy E Award for Excellence was a really coveted award for productivity. And they won that several times. And this color photo was actually a Bren gun carrier that is at the museum in Hudson, the American Heritage Museum. And the bottom photo is the Bren gun carriers actually coming off the assembly line in Somerville. And they were mostly used by uh, British troops. The uh, Springfield Motorcycle Company, uh, the Indian Motorcycle Company, rather, in Springfield, they made 22,000 motorcycles that were used mostly by the British Commonwealth. Um, in Lemonster, the Lucite Company, they made plastic windshields for um, B-32 bombers. In Haverhill, which was the shoe capital of Massachusetts, they converted you know, a lot of their factories to making things like cartridge belts and knapsacks and duffel bags and all kinds of other things. Um, some companies just produced their regular product, like the Neko Company, manufacturers of the famous Neko wafer. They sent them to armed forces at home and abroad. Um, the Boston Elevated, which was the elevated subway car, uh, they employed female conductors for the first time. They were known as conductorettes. <laughs> and it was the first time in 50 years. So they, they had the same duties as the men, and they were paid the same amount of money. Now, uh, <clears throat> a lot of other residents participated by actually joining the service. And there were 500,000 Massachusetts men and women who served during World War II. And, and you see I have my, my service flag here, my blue star flag. And so you could buy a flag, and you would hang it on your window, and if it was a blue star, that meant you had someone in the service. And if that person was killed in action, then it became a gold star. And then um, companies would then hang their own flag for their employees. This happens to be from the Boston Globe. So at the time this picture was taken in, I think, 42 or 3, they had three of their employees were killed, and they had 132 serving. Um, there was one of these flying from Framingham Town Hall. It's in the uh, Stephen Herring book. You can see a, a picture of it. Now, the woman who probably had more flags or more stars than anybody was Annie Jordan of Jamaica Plain. She had, um, they did a story in her when she placed the 10th blue star on her service flag as her son Francis uh, reported to Fort Devens joining his nine brothers who are already in the service. Um, some well-known people who served were um, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was our senator. He actually served twice in Italy and in North Africa. Um, President Roosevelt's son, John, he was uh, working at Filene's at the time, and um, he joined. Arthur Fiedler was in the Coast Guard Reserve. <clears throat> and then uh, two Red Sox players. So one of them had um, a season average of 406 one year, which has never been repeated. He's in the Hall of Fame. He has a, a 
road and a tunnel named after him. The other one found himself at a conference in Zurich in 1944 carrying a Luger pistol and a capsule of cyanide. You'll have to read the book to find out who that was. But Ted Williams, Ted Williams, there was lots of discussion over Ted Williams and anyone, anyone who was famous, especially in the sporting world, people were just questioning what's their service availability. Are they in, are they out, and Ted Williams especially. And he had never had a very good relationship with the press anyway. So Ted, his, he went from uh, 1A, which is ready for service, to 3A, which was he was supporting um, a relative, which was his mother. He was the sole financial support for his mother. And his status flip-flopped, and it was reported on you know, every, every time something changed in the news. And he didn't have much comment about it. And, and then finally, um, one day in uh, May of 1942, it just was reported that he had, he had enlisted the day before. He had gone into um, Boston, and he joined the uh, V-5 pilot training program. He never actually saw any action, he, and that might have been you know, purposeful on the part of the, um, of the Navy. He, he did some training, and then he was a pilot trainer himself. He did see action in the Korean War. Um, interestingly enough, so he went into um, near the Boston Garden. I have the street listed, but you can look it up. Anyway, so he went in there on, on May 22nd and enlisted, and that's what this is a picture of. Three weeks to the day, another Massachusetts resident went in and signed up for the same Navy flying program, and that was George Bush Sr., interestingly enough. I said that the family pets got involved. Well, believe it or not, they had a program called Dogs for Defense. Now, think about your friends who have dogs, or maybe you yourself. Um, many dogs today, including my own siblings who own dogs, treat them like members of the family, um, even better than members of the family. So it is really hard to imagine people in, in 2023 just offering up their dog to be taken by the army and maybe never to be returned and to be put in harm's way for two or three years. But people did this. Children, and, and I'm going to tell you a story about these children on the, on the left there. Um, children were begging their parents to let their dogs go off to war. So this was called the Dogs for Defense program. It was the brainchild of Harry Caesar. He was the president of the American Kennel Club. And he noted that dogs, they had you know, superior senses of hearing, vision, and smell. And um, they had been in use for years by their enemies and some other allies. So he thought that we could recruit 125,000 dogs to do guard duty, to do military duty. They would be brought to regional centers, they would be trained, and then they would be shipped off to different parts of the country or the world. Um, and the response was overwhelming. So they had to be well-behaved purebreds between one and five years old, weighing at least 50 pounds and 18 inches high. And then as the need increased, mixed breeds were allowed, except for chows, they were found to be just unreliable and rejected. Sorry, chows. Um, so there was a kennel in Newton that was a receiving center. Um, they were trained in various places. One of them was in Dedham at some old uh, polo grounds near the Charles River. And here's a couple of stories of some dogs, some of them who, who didn't quite measure up. So six-year-old uh, Moose, oh, sorry, Mose of Milton was returned by the Army because of his friendly nature. Um, and fourth grader Lloyd Beckett Jr. had had a blue star hanging in his window for his dog Mose, and he took that down when Mose was returned. <clears throat> now, this dog, the German Shepherd you see on the left with the two children, his name was Sailor, and he was from Randolph. He was owned by the McKenzie family. That is, um, let's see, seven-year-old Ann and five-year-old Robert McKenzie. Oh, they look like they're the same age, but anyway. Um, so they decided they wanted Sailor to go off because they had an uncle who was in the service. So Sailor was, you know, shipped off. They didn't hear anything at all for a couple of years until 1944. They got a letter from Burma, uh, which was written by Army Captain Charles Fallon. And Fallon described Sailor's courage under fire and in how his intelligence had saved American lives on more than one occasion. Um, 
He was on patrol with his handler, whose name was Rusty Meisner, and he alerted to some movement that Rusty hadn't noticed behind some um, bushes, and it turned out that there were Japanese snipers there. And so Rusty Meisner was able to take care of them. And again, Sailor another time alerted, and they were able to capture a Japanese soldier. At, towards the end of his <clears throat> enlistment, Meisner wrote to the family and asked if he could keep Sailor because they, he had saved his life on several occasions and become really close to him. And the family was a little reluctant. The kids wanted their dog back. It became sort of a, a, at least a local news event. There was a, a man from Cambridge who offered the Mackenzies a, a new Irish setter pup if Randy Meisner, not Randy Meisner, he's like a, a rock star, <laughs> if um, Rusty Meisner could keep Sailor. And um, they said no, and so Sailor came home in March of 1946. And he was featured in a um, children's book about hero dogs. The other dog up here is a local dog named Bessie. Bessie was from Dedham. Um, her owners were Ford and Josephine Friend. So Bessie worked um, for a Coast Guard unit. This is her discharge paper here, um, an honorable discharge. And that's a picture of Bessie on patrol. And Bessie came back safely after the war. But she had one little behavior quirk. Whenever the 4th of July fireworks went off, uh, she would run under the table the way she had been trained to do. And then after a long, happy life in Dedham, <clears throat> she passed on and was buried in the backyard wrapped in her favorite blanket. All right, so we can't talk about World War II in Massachusetts without talking about some of the military installations that we had here. Um, there's, there's many, many, many. And, and I don't talk about, and the two of them are right here in Framingham. So, um, this is just a partial list, that, and I kind of put them into categories. And you can see we had, <clears throat> we had the forts there where people were trained, and um, that's Fort Devens, Camp Edwards, Camp Miles Standish, and Camp Framingham. And then they would mostly be trained there and move on to somewhere else. Um, we had production facilities, the Watertown Arsenal, which had been around for hundreds of years anyway. Springfield Armory, again, was during George Washington's time the Boston Navy Yard, the Four River Shipyard. We had uh, air stations. We had coastal defenses down in New Bedford, guarding the Cape Cod Canal on both ends and in Boston Harbor. And we also had <clears throat> some ammunition depots, uh, one of them right next door in Sudbury. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, this is the, uh, the Main Maynard Ammo Dump. And the Maynard Ammo Dump, uh, let's see, that was created out of farmland. And what I say in the book is that, you know, there were costs for war. There were many, many people who lost their homes that they had been in their family for centuries, like 100-year-old houses that were either moved or demolished to make way for some of these military installations. And whether it's propaganda, I, I don't really know, but a lot of the news stories reported that the people were saying, well, it's what we got to do to win the war. Um, not all, but many of the, the people had that sentiment. So you can now walk this. It's the Assabet River w National Wildlife Refuge, and there's 55 of these concrete bunkers there. Um, they were connected by, by rail, so those paths that you walk on, if you've ever been there, are actually the old where the railroad were. And, and the picture on the left is when it was in operation, and the picture on the right is what it looks like now. So there was a lot of U-boat activity off the coast. And to help combat that, we had the South Weymouth Naval Air Station, which was a blimp station. <clears throat> it was a 1,200-acre site and included parts of uh, Abington and Rockland, as well as South Weymouth. And <clears throat> It had a couple of squadrons of, they call them airships, or LTAs, lighter than air. <clears throat> they carried depth bombs. They had machine guns. They had, uh, this hangar was built. This, this hangar on the bottom is 956 feet wide, 150 feet tall. It covers four acres. <clears throat> and their job was to patrol from up to Maine down to Rhode Island and to also to assist in, um, there were a lot of sinkings of, of freighters, and they would assist in the rescue operations. One particular, and this is long after, like, the intense U-boat activity. This is in June of 44. 
a fishing trawler called the Lark encountered a U-boat. Um, it was June 5th of 44. There were 26 men on this wooden sailing fishing ship, and they were up off the um, coast of Canada near Nova Scotia, and they were attacked by a U-boat. The, and all of the men were from the area, Dorchester and Mattapan and Hyde Park. So the men, except for three people and one dog, the rest of the men boarded the dories and kind of uh, rowed away from their ship. And then for 15 minutes, this sub attacked the lark, and you can see some of the damage done. That's a, a big shell hole in the wheelhouse where the captain had been standing just moments earlier. And there are some of the holes on the side of the lark. Um, when the uh, lark submerged, it collided with some of the dories, and there was one man who was holding an oar, and he kind of swatted. Oops. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, technology. <laughs> he, uh, he swatted at the U-boat, and it broke his oar, and then his friends teased him for trying to attack a U-boat with just an oar. Um, but they all survived, and they all, they all came back. Hold on. All right. Wow. Oh, still works. Okay. <clears throat> now, with all of these uh, air bases around and all of these pilots who were training, who were not really skilled at the beginning, there were a lot of crashes. In fact, there were over 100 <clears throat> flyers killed in Massachusetts during the war. And many of these happened, like, on the air bases themselves, takeoffs and landings, but a lot of them happened just in towns, over fields, over uh, urban areas. This particular, and I've been driving by this place for years and never knew about it, this is a memorial to two uh, Royal Air Force pilots who were training out of Squantum, which was another air base in Quincy, um, when their plane happened to have some kind of mechanical problems and it crashed. This is um, Charles River Street in Grove. It's sort of the Needham, Natick, Wellesley line and crashed, and, and they were killed. And just a few years ago, this memorial was put up for those two. But there was another crash in Mattapan, where my parents were living at the time, like right in the neighborhood. There was, um, and there are memorials to these flyers in these towns that you see here. The Haverhill one was just um, dedicated last September to a, a flyer who, unfortunately, he, he, um, he lived in Haverhill, so he, all his friends and family came out to watch him fly. And, and sadly, he crashed. But, um, and, and I've read this in many stories, he maneuvered his plane away from crowded areas and crashed in some woodlands. All right. Now, many of you know the expression, Kilroy was here. So what is that? Well, <clears throat> Kilroy was sort of some graffiti that soldiers started writing. It started appearing uh, about the middle of the war in Europe, <clears throat> and it would have this drawing of this, this big-nosed guy peering over a fence and say, Kilroy was here. And there were other examples of something like this earlier in World War I. There, there was a, a British guy, um, and his, the World War I guy's, his name was like Tony or something. And so it, it's hard to pinpoint exactly how it started, but it took off. It became popular on the home front. And um, it was found in cartoons. You know, kids would doodle it on the cover of their, their notebook. Um, I found a, a few articles where kids who didn't do their homework, uh, they would say, oh, Kilroy took it. I don't know. <laughs> so it became like a meme that we have today. Um, it was even the subject of a movie in 1947. And if you go to the National World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., there are columns, and Kilroy is, is inscribed on two of them, kind of hidden. So they've talked, you know, people have uh, wondered, like, how did it start? Who Was there a, really a Kilroy? And <clears throat> there are two people who were the leading candidates for being the actual Kilroy, and they're both from Massachusetts. So the first one was Sergeant Francis Kilroy of Everett. Um, in an article in the Globe in 1945, um, he told the story of how he was stationed at Boca Raton, Florida, training, and he had a bout of the flu, so he had to go to the infirmary. And his friend, uh, named Jimmy Maloney, missed him from, you know, training or in the barracks or whatever. So he just started writing, Kilroy will be back next week. So then when uh, Sergeant Francis Kilroy 
got better, and he shipped overseas, and he landed, and then everywhere he went, he saw Kilroy was here, and supposedly written by his friend to honor him. Well, he had his moment of fame. It was more of a local fame because people across the country, this is after the war, were still wondering, who is Kilroy? And there were lots of letters to the editor. I was Kilroy. I knew Kilroy. So finally, the American Transit Association, along with the Boston Elevated Company, they had a contest, an essay contest, to see who, once and for all, who was the real Kilroy. And the prize was a defunct trolley car. <laughs> Just what everybody needs. A 20-ton, 1910 model streetcar. <clears throat> well, they found a winner. His name was James J. Kilroy. He was a 44-year-old father of six from Halifax. He had started working at the Four Rivers Four River Shipyard in Quincy a couple of days before Pearl Harbor. And he says that he used to write the phrase on the parts that he inspected. Kilroy was here. <clears throat> he also wrote it on the bulkheads of some ships that were made there, the, uh, the Lexington, the Baltimore, and the Massachusetts. Well, they liked his story the best, so they awarded him the prize. And this is a picture of them loading it up to deliver it to Halifax, Mass. Now, Kilroy had nine children, and he had told everyone that he was going to use it to, uh, as a bedroom for six of his nine children. Now, people still were you know, a little sketchy about whether this was the real Kilroy. However, the final word, I think, was said in November of, of 1946 in an editorial on, in a California newspaper. And I'll read it to you. It says, Kilroy's identity really is of little consequence. People all over the world know who the real Kilroy was. He was personified in the American fighting man whose valor and industry defied the dictators who believed Kilroy couldn't get here, and if he did, he couldn't stay. Well, here we are in Framingham. So some of you might recognize this as Cushing General Hospital. Um, let's go to the Cushing part. Okay, it was established, uh, that's 110 acres in the southwest section of Framingham near Farm Pond, close to the railroad line. Uh, construction began in April of 1943, and it was dedicated in January of 44, named for Dr. Harvey Cushing, who was a brilliant neurosurgeon who taught at Harvard Medical School. And he had been a colonel in France in World War uh, one. There were 95 semi-permanent buildings, which included medical facilities, uh, patient housing, administrators' headquarters, barracks for staff, warehouses, recreation halls, a chapel. There were hospital trains arriving from Boston on a regular basis. It was built to service uh, 1,750 patients, but at its peak it housed over 3,000 war wounded. Um, and there were over 1,000 military personnel, volunteers, and civilians working there. And if you walk the grounds at all, I'll help you out here. This is the only building left. That's the chapel right here. So this would be Dudley Road. And this would be, I guess, Harvey Cushing Way. And then Winter Street is up here. And, and some of these paths are, are still here. They're just, you, you know, you can, as you walk, if you've ever walked to Cushing Park, you can sort of visualize where it was. And um, there's a great book about the history of the hospital written by our town historian Fred Wallace called Pushing for Cushing. You can get it at the Framingham History Center. Um, one of the facts I liked that he wrote was that there are still some trees there that were um, planted by German POWs who used to do some of the grounds work there. All right, the Muster Field. So the Muster Field is a housing project up on Concord Street. But during World War II, it was known as Camp Framingham. It's 100 acres off Concord Street, and it had been known since the muster field. It was established in 1872 as um, training for the Massachusetts Volunteer Militia, which we today call the National Guard. And it had been a staging area for wars um, in the Spanish-American War, the Mexican conflict in 1916, and World War I. So soldiers arrived in May of 1942. They were the 131st Combat Engineering Battalion, and it, the place had been in disuse for a number of years, so they rebuilt it. But they built it to look like a typical American town. Remember, this is you know, six months after Pearl Harbor, and they were still worried about enemy attack. So the homes that you see on the left are actually barracks. Um, 
they were a big open area. The garage was actually the, the shower facilities. And the, um, they made them look like churches and schools. And so this, this particular battalion, they, they trained there in, this, in what looked like a typical New England village. And um, many of them shipped out in November of 43 to the Pacific, where they served in Guam and the Philippines. But the remnants are still there today. And you can see, this, this is taken recently. This is Corregidor on the right. And those are the same houses. So now they were converted to actual houses. And people are still living in them today. <clears throat> now, this is the story of, of the chapel that was at the muster field. Every one of the military installations that was a, you know, a camp or a fort had a chapel. Uh, camp Edwards actually had 13 because it was so huge. So this was the one at um, the muster field at Camp Framingham. And that, on the left, top left, that's what it looked like when the soldiers were there. Well, after the war, there was a lot of army surplus. And the people in uh, St. Anne's by the Sea in uh, Marshfield, where I know we have some residents, uh, there was a huge fire in 1941, the Great Fire, and, and St. Anne's Church burned down. So after the war, they dismantled the church from the muster field, and they brought it down to St. Anne's, and they rebuilt it. And so the top right is what it looked like when it was in service as the church, and it still stands today. Now it is the parish center, which is the picture on the bottom. There was another chapel that was um, from Camp Miles Standish, which was in Taunton, and that was dismantled and brought to Milton to be the new St. Elizabeth's Church, and it served as their church for 17 years until they built another one. All right, so now we are coming to the end of my talk and the end of the war. So, a lot of celebration. Um, VE Day was a little bit subdued because we were still fighting in Japan. So VE would be Victory Europe, VJ is Victory Japan. But VJ Day is when people pulled out all the stops. So this fella, and this, this was a, one of the things, like they just, let's just throw women in the frog pond because that's how we celebrate the end of a war. Um, <laughs> There was another there was a story about a sailor who, who walked out on the, the ledge of the maybe the fifth floor of the hotel terrain and was dancing around until his friends pulled him in. There were casks of beer in the streets. People would just grab anything and start banging them. You can imagine, I mean, this is four years of, of you know, rationing and shortages and worrying and, and people, it was such a relief. And I think that, you know, the... 21st century mentality of war is a little bit different. Just reading and everything that I read, most, it was just like, we won. That was the general spirit. We won. It, it was, there were, you know, there were people who were like, well, look at, you know, but most people like, you know, we, 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 we beat the bad guys, and so let's celebrate. Now, <clears throat> the boy on the left is one of my favorite stories. Um, and again, this is one of those stories that hasn't really been told in about 80 years. So his name is Charlie Sparato. So on VJ Day, which was August of 45, he left his house in East Boston to go sell his newspapers on Boston Common. And <clears throat> he got there a little bit early and was watching the festivities. And while he was there, this young woman in her 20s, well-dressed, walked up. She was carrying a baby, maybe about four or five weeks old. She said, um, I need to make a phone call. Will, will you hold my baby for me? He, I'll give you $2. Says, okay. She never came back. So Charlie is standing there for a long time holding this baby, looking for the woman. And finally, he, he got these um, two other young women, they were from Dorchester, to help him out because he had to go sell his newspapers. So they took the baby, and they looked around for the woman, could not find her anywhere. So finally, the three of them walked over to the, um, the police station on Joy Street, and they told their story to the police. The police took the baby in, and so th the search was on to find who the mother was. They named him a um, couple of nicknames. They called him Douglas, after Douglas MacArthur, or Little Mr. Victory. That's the name that kind of stuck. Um, so they investigated. They took his footprints. They went around to all the hospitals. Um, they put it in the paper. They had a description of the baby. He was dark-haired. He was blue-eyed. He was in good health. He was dressed nicely. Um, he uh, weighed about... Uh, no, that can't be right. Never mind. Okay, so... <laughs> 
Um, they had, he had the initials TMK. It sounds like something out of Dickens. Um, embroidered on his shirt. They, they chased some leads to Long Island, to Portland, Maine, but no luck. And then after a while, and this is my assumption, is that they had to turn him over to social services, and then it's nobody's business what happens to this young baby. It's, you know, the, the records are closed. So 60 years later, on the anniversary of VJ Day, uh, there was an article in the Boston Globe about Charlie and about little Mr. Victory. A few weeks later, the Globe got a letter from Charlie himself. And Charlie corrected some of the mistakes that had been made. And he closed his letter with saying, I would like to meet Mr. Victory, if that's possible. Mr. Victory, where are you? So Mr. Victory would be 60 years old at that time. Charlie was 76. Well, during my research, I found uh, this obscure website that had nothing to do with World War II. But somewhere on it, this man um, wrote about how he found little Mr. Victory. So I contacted him. I said, I'm writing a book about World War II. Who's Mr. Victory? He goes, I'm writing a book about Mr. Victory. <laughs> So I ain't telling you. <laughs> so that was that. So um, there was a woman in Chicago that I believe might be Mr. Victory's daughter. That, that's the only clue I had. So I wrote in my book that those familiar with the story have asked the same question for years and are hopeful that the mystery will one day be solved and shared. <laughs> I guess. Um, so after the war, they were memorials put up. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting was that um, the memorial, like the actual services for the dead, did not start happening until about 1947 because they, they could not send bodies back home during the war. So it was October of 1947 before any of the, the war dead were returned home. And when they were, they had <coughs> ceremonies that you would think would be worthy of, of a general or a king. This particular one on the right is from Dedham. Uh, he was uh, Anthony Palermo, who was killed in action in Normandy. And he, <clears throat> it's not a very good picture, but his coffin is on the same case on that carried uh, President Roosevelt just three years earlier and pulled by white horses. And so this was happening all across the state. The, the, um, the, war, the bodies would be met at train stations with, with um, honor guard from the American Legion, the VFW. And they... <clears throat> and it, Every single one of them, and week after week, you read in the paper about these, these ceremonies, and, and people in town came out to, to honor these dead. Um, and then they started making memorials. This is our Framingham War Memorial. This is an old picture. It's been refurbished since then. That came in, in 1953. These are the two plaques in our city hall. They honor the 87 men who gave their lives in World War II. And, and also uh, some from the Korean conflict. And I'm going to tell you one Framingham story. So this is Raymond Hickey. He was born in Framingham on February 28, 1922. His father, John, was a patrolman, a policeman, and his mother, Mary, was a housewife. He had an older brother, John, who was born in 1920. Uh, when Raymond was about three years old, his parents moved to a few blocks from Clark Street to Arthur Street into this home, which was about eight years old at the time. Um, we call it a New England four square. And um, <clears throat> there were lots of kids in the neighborhood. Most of the people on the street worked for the Denison Manufacturing Company. And um, Ray's best friend and next door neighbor was Walter O'Donnell. Raymond left high school after three years. He was working at a metal shop in town in December of 1941. And he and his friend Walter, his next door neighbor, were actually in the movies when they found out that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. So he enlisted in the Army Air Corps in Boston, and he trained as a radio man in, at Scott Field in Illinois. He also trained in Texas, in Arizona, New Mexico, and Nebraska. He shipped out in December of 1943 to an air base in England. And there he was assigned as a radio man on a 10-member crew in the 702nd Bomber Squadron. squadron. Um, in April of 43, his parents, they had been getting letters from Raymond all along. They received a letter on April 12th um, describing the nine recent bombing missions that he had been on recently. That was the last letter they got. 
So a few weeks later, they got a telegram delivered to the home on Arthur Street, and it said that the Secretary of War desires me to express his deep regret that your son, Raymond J. Hickey, has been reported missing in action since April 13th over Germany. If further details or other information are received, you'll be promptly notified. And they later learned <clears throat> that his son and his crew had taken off from Station 124 in England on a bombing mission over Germany. I can't read the German name <laughs> of that town. Um, their target, they were, they were hit by anti-aircraft carrier, and they crashed. And when they found his body, his status was updated from missing in action to killed in action. His uh, remains were returned in 1949, and he was buried with full honors at St. Stephen's Cemetery, and he was posthumously awarded the Purple Heart. So in 1973, his parents sold their home on Arthur Street to their son John for one dollar. <clears throat> John lived there for the next uh, 30 years. He passed away there. The house was purchased by um, a couple of other people. It was updated, but it retained a lot of its original features. And then in December 2012, the house was purchased by me. So, um, I will just read from what I wrote in my book. Um, and I, I, I knew nothing about Raymond until I started researching this book. There were a few clues that the Hickeys had left behind. I, I always would find coal, like nuggets, like clunkers in my backyard. Um, there was a, an old yellowed permit for a, a propane stove from 1934. Um, so I wrote that those of us who happen to live in a house built before the war have the privilege of standing in the kitchens where beleaguered moms created meals without the basic ingredients of milk, butter, and meat, in backyards where victory gardens flourished, in garages where paper and rubber was stored before being hauled to the salvage drive, in living rooms and parlors where moms and dads read the daily newspaper and listened to news reports and presidential addresses on the radio. While working on this book in my Arthur Street home, the Hickey family was never far from my thoughts. As I pictured them struggling with the daily sacrifices they made and challenges they faced during wartime, from the mildly inconvenient to the devastatingly tragic. The fact that a young man barely out of his teens left this house to serve his country and never returned is a very powerful reminder to me of the sacrifice made by him and thousands like him. I am honored to share his story and add it to the annals of American heroes. That would be a good ending but there's more. Um, so the, the back of the book, the very end of the book, I, I talk about some of the places you can explore in Massachusetts to learn more about World War II. Um, a lot of them are military, and like I said, the, the story of the home front is, is, you know, it's told in the homes that are still around. It's told on the town commons at City Hall. Um, but the military story, uh, we have quite a few places. The American Heritage Museum is a great place. If you haven't been there, it's in Hudson. They do reenactments. Um, they were in the news just a few weeks ago, one of their planes, it didn't really crash, it just had a, a problem when, uh, upon landing. Um, you can also uh, buy a, yourself a tank ride there, or you can learn to drive a tank. And they have a huge warehouse full of mostly World War II era planes and tanks and all kinds of other great things. Um, you could walk around in Sudbury, the Assabet River National Wildlife Refuge, and see those concrete bunkers. The Charlestown Navy Yard is a uh, part of the federal par uh, national park system. And that's where the USS Cassin Young is on the right here. So you could tour that World War II era ship. It wasn't built there. It was built in California, but it's similar to the ships that were built at the Navy Yard. Um, the Fort Devens Museum is small, but it's great. It's got so many different things, and they also help with research. There's an unbelievable museum um, down in B New Bedford. It's, it's just wall-to-wall -wall artifacts. You, you, your eyes will just go crazy from looking at everything, and you could spend hours there. Um, there's the Patton Homestead in Hamilton. So George Patton actually lived in Massachusetts. He married uh, Beatrice Ayer, who was the daughter of one of the Lowell wool merchants. And in the 20s, um, they were gifted a, a colonial-era farm in Hamilton. And actually, George Patton, it's in the book, he came and, and visited the farm um, after uh, VE Day, and it was a and he came to Boston in this huge turnout for him. And um, so you can go visit his homestead. They use it for, for town events. So finally, um, this book is dedicated to 
I guess my parents, mostly. My father, we'll start with him. This is my father, George. He hated that name, so we called him Don. Uh, well, I called him Dad. But um, so he, my, he served in the 102nd uh, Chemical Processing Company in China, Burma, and India. Uh, he enlisted at age 18. And my mother, and that's my grandfather. This is my mother right here. So she's only 17 there. She actually worked in the Navy Yard at age 17. Um, she graduated high school at 16, and she worked at the Navy Yard decoding messages. Her sister, her older sister, Jean, also worked at the Navy Yard. Her brothers, uh, that's Ed, was in the Navy. Gerald was in the Army. Her two younger brothers were always in sailor suits, uh, Jimmy and Paul. My father had three brothers who all served, and they all came back. So this is what the, the blue star here is to kind of honor them. And they were very typical of a lot of families who not only had people in the service, but had people working in you know, some of the, the uh, military installations or the, some of the manufacturing plants or some of the bases. Like here in Framingham, lots of civilians work. So I <clears throat> have uh, decided to kind of honor their service and, and the service of many families like them, probably your families as well. So, the book is um, coming out on, coincidentally, March 4th. <laughs> uh, so, and it will be available at the Framingham History Center and, and other places around here. So, and just, you know, you can look me up online. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to all my old McCarthy friends for coming out and to my new friends. <clears throat> And uh, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. You mean when it was here? Yeah, well, they, <clears throat> they made it look like a church, but they did use it as a church, but they, they also used it for, you know, correct. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. And, and those pictures, there, there was a, a man named um, Charles Loftiness, who uh, he since passed away, but he, he wrote a little history that you can get in the library here of his service at the muster field. And <clears throat> most of the pictures that we have that are in the History Center were his pictures that he took. So those, those barracks that were actually houses now were his, his pictures. He was here for, for a short time. And uh, Pennant, Camp Framingham Pennant, yep. Yes. Uh, I assume they all did, I, but he's the only one that I, I found information on. Yeah. Well, the sugar supply line was cut off for one thing. So a lot of these things, like like the rubber was, was cut off because they couldn't get natural rubber. So a lot of times it had to do with supply issues. Oh, you mean like if in your, in your house? I don't know. I, I'd have to talk to a baker. <laughs> right. Well, that's probably true, but I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe people are baking more I, more things using sugar than we do today. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but it was it was it was also the last thing um, to be taken off rationing. So, I, I you know it's a good question. I guess it was vital, but I'll have to do more research. <laughs> True, right? People are home canning. Yeah. So, yeah, probably it, it was something that, that it's hard for us to connect to today because everything's prepackaged. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's after the war. I think so, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> A big target. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I do remember that. It was like a World War I cannon or something. If, if it most likely, because I remember growing up, people would, would always say, if you go in a cemetery and you see the holes, it was World War II. And I'm like, really? I don't know. But then I found actual articles, like the, the conquered one. You know, I didn't want to report it unless I saw in writing that they actually took that fence and gave it to the scrap pile. And they did. It was in the conquered newspaper, like, hey, we're taking the fence down. Um, yeah, well, most of it, yeah. A lot of it is is um, newspaper articles because that they reported on on the things that I think would be like footnotes in in other histories, you know, the things that I find interesting and they're forgotten. But there was also a lot of books just to get the backgrounds, you know, what was happening in the world. And uh, but I'm retired, so I had time. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Right, and and then I, I I had also read that a lot of the stuff actually didn't get used, and so I I did find, I mean again people have written whole books about like scrap drives, but what I concluded is that you know a lot of the things that were brought to salvage were not usable. Like aluminum, they had huge aluminum pots and pans, but they couldn't make planes. It had to be virgin aluminum. So I don't think the people knew that at the time, but what they did. You know, it has historians have said that it was a big morale booster, and that because that was early in the war, um, and and like a lot of the rubber that they brought in was had already been recycled once, and so it couldn't be recycled again, um, and they didn't know that, but it, it didn't matter. And there there were there were there were kids who um, they won a scrap drive and they they got to christen a ship up in Maine. So these three kids went and they got to you know bang the champagne. So they were giving prizes, they'd give movie tickets, and there were schools that, um, for the war bonds, they donated enough, or they bought enough war bonds, they got to buy a Jeep, so they would drive the Jeep to the school, and all the kids would come out and have their picture taken, and then they'd drive it off. So, what's that? <laughs> LJ. <clears throat> yeah. Right, right. Um, so it, a lot of the things were just to, it was a propaganda war as well. To, 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 I mean, imagine four years, and a lot of us were like, during COVID, like, oh, when's this going to end? This is four years. And at the same time, you, you know, you, your brother's over in Burma, maybe getting killed. So they, there was a lot of things to try to, you know, keep the, keep the momentum going. And you can read all about it in March. <laughs> Yes. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's You're welcome. Good to see you. Um, there's a lot of particular stories in this book. This is um, Ray Callahan's Historical Reflections. And where he talks about individual Framingham uh, servicemen, like a bunch of them. So 